speaker today, Eric Wahlberg, who is here program leader for climate services at the Manhattan Center for Conservation Sciences, right here in Plymouth, just a little bit south of here. Um, he's going to be speaking to us today about watershed management in a warming world, as I'm sure you are all aware, as Eric will give us much more information on uh, the impact of climate change on our watersheds, uh, potentially be numerous and disastrous, ranging from increased precipitation to increased temperatures to sea level rise, all of the impact on our, our habitats and uh, the things we value uh, that those impacts might have. So um, I'll, I'll let Eric cover all of that. Um, so with that, here's Eric Walker. several ice age cycles. Now this trace is tender, how that's tracked along during the same 400,000 year period of record. Um, this is ice core data from the Antarctic and it gives us a very detailed look at how both CO2 levels and temperature have fluctuated over a long period of time. Now here's where we are today. Um, you can see a very stark departure from, from what's been the norm, so to speak, in, in the range of fluctuation. Now, there, there's a very complicated interplay that takes place between the oceans and the atmosphere in, in these previous warming and cooling events, but it's safe to say, based on research today, that once a, a warming cycle is kicked off, um, it is, in fact, the CO2 rise in the atmosphere that ends up driving the warming. 
Now, in a business as usual scenario, here's where we would be by 2050. Now, this is um, an absence of any significant measures to draw down CO2 emissions. So you can see um, this is a continued, almost straight up trajectory in terms of, of growth of greenhouse gas and gas. Uh, there's no doubt in the world that the planet's warming up. Uh, you may still see occasionally you ask me uh, that there are some people that still question this. Um, the scientific community has reached closure on this question. There are multiple lines of evidence. I'm sure you guys are, are familiar with that. Um, but just you know, be aware if you see any continued discussion in the media about this, um, that's people just stirring the pot on, on an issue that's been closed. Um, unfortunately, one of the pieces of the puzzle with this that's not well known is that thus far the oceans have taken up nearly 90% of the additional warming that's taken place associated with this additional increment of, of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Um, I like to think of the ocean as being a flywheel for the climate. Um, you know, during the period of the evolution of, of human society, We've had a, a, an amazingly stable climate that, that's due in large part to the stabilizing effect of the, of the ocean. Um, if you think of the oceans as a flywheel, what we're doing is we're speeding up the flywheel, if you will. We're adding more energy to that system. And that is going to have ramifications over the long haul for our climate. I've got a series of slides here that are images from the 2014 update of the U.S. National Climate Assessment. Uh, again, I'm sure you guys are familiar with this document. It's a great resource. It contains um, synopsis by topic and by region. And so uh, a wonderful place to go for um, uh, condensation of, of the science on this topic. Now, now this shows um, measured change in temperature over the last 20 years. This is um, as compared to uh, early century to mid-century average. You can see there are some very important regional differences here. The darkest red color an increase in 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit during that 20 year period. The darkest blue a decrease in 1.5. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about where the science is in trying to understand why we're getting these regional anomalies and warming and cooling. Um, as, as I'm sure you're aware, um, you know, we've essentially got our finger on the thermostat of the climate system right now. Um, emissions rates going forward will have everything to do with the amount of warming that we see by the end of the century. Um, on the left, what you see is a low emission scenario, which would um, call for uh, a fairly dramatic drawdown in CO2 emissions rates. Um, with that, um, we could limit warming by the end of the century to 4 to 5 degrees Fahrenheit on average. Um, on the right hand side, um, a more aggressive emissions situation, um, close to being business as usual. And in that case, we're looking at eight to nine degrees on average. Um, now the situation on the left, I think, is something that we can, in many instances, adapt to. The situation on the right is getting out on the fringe of that. There will be many situations where, um, even though we have a lot of technical resources um, at our disposal in the US, we have a very difficult time adapting. Now, um, how many of you um, saw in the media that 2014 um, went in the record books as it was the warmest year um, globally uh, on the record? Those people see that? Um, this was a map that ran in the New York Times, and a uh, fascinating image, because it really gets at the important regional differences that are taking place um, in warming. You can see up in the Arctic, um, those are the areas where you've got um, a warming of you know, 7 degrees Fahrenheit, the darkest red. The areas in blue um, are cooling of nearly 2 degrees. Now, how could this be? You know, well, it doesn't seem that you know, if, you, if you raised the CO2 levels um, uniformly in the atmosphere, wouldn't you think that you would get um, uniform warming? Well, um, there, there are many factors that, that drive these, these regional differences. Um, on a global scale, I think it's reasonable to think about the temperature distribution essentially just taking the normal bell curve and shifting it to the right. So in that case, if you look at global averages, what we're seeing is a decrease in the coldest conditions, an increase in average temperature, and an increase in extreme heat. On a regional basis, unfortunately, it's a much messier situation. Um, in some cases, we're seeing increased variability. In, in this case, the, the bell curve essentially being stretched and pulled out. So you've got this combination, on the one hand, of increased polar conditions and increased warm conditions and more variability. 
Um, and then messier yet is the notion of changed symmetry in the distribution. And this is very much what we're seeing in the Northeast, is this combination of um, factors that it's not this nice neat shift to the right, if you will, in temperature distribution. Now, one of the drivers for that is the fact that we're heavily influenced by the decline in, in Arctic sea ice that's been taking place. What you see here on the left is an image of sea ice coverage back in 1992 at the end of the summer season when we've got maximum melting. On the right, you see a minimum that we hit in 2012, um, same thing in the, in the summer season. And this has got very important ramifications both for climate and for weather. From a climate perspective, this is setting up a feedback loop where it's dramatically changing the albedo in the Arctic. And so during the summer months now, you've got less reflective surface, um, more open sea that can absorb heat from the sun. Um, so that sets up this positive feedback loop. And this is one of the reasons that the poles are warming more rapidly than the lower latitudes. Um, also, it has important ramifications for weather. And I think one of the reasons that we've seen a lot of counterintuitive weather in the Northeast is the fact that we've reached a point that we've got much more open water um, in the Arctic now, and that is having a direct influence on our weather. There's some fascinating research that's taking place, and, and you need to take this with a grain of salt because this is an area of the science that's highly debated right now. There's certainly no final answers, but to me, this is absolutely fascinating because it lines up very nicely with what we've been living through, and in particular what we lived through this winter, with the incredibly cold temperatures and, and very heavy snowfall. And one of the findings is, is as the temperature differential between the Arctic and the lower latitudes becomes less, we're seeing a larger amplitude wave in, in the upper atmosphere steering currents that control the placement of weather systems and the progression of weather systems from the west to the east. So what you see here in the graphic in, in the solid line is the more typical situation that we've had in the steering currents in the past with a slightly lower amplitude wave and a more rapid progression of weather systems from the west to the east. And then in the dotted line, what we've seen more recently, and that is a situation with this higher amplitude wave and an associated slower progression. And what this potentially sets us up for is more extreme weather conditions associated with stagnation and progression of weather systems. And this could manifest in the West as the heat waves and the drought that we've been seeing. It could manifest in the East as the cold spells and the very heavy snow events that we've seen. Now, again, take this with a grain of salt, highly debated in the scientific community. Um, this is real active discussion about the extent to which this is normal variation of weather the extent to which this change is in fact linked to global warming. It um, be interesting to see how it plays out, but for right now I think this is one of the more um, uh, fruitful lines of research and helping us understand some second tier effects of climate change and how that can directly impact our weather and create some very counterintuitive effects. All right, so moving on to precipitation, um, this map reads very much um, in a similar way to the temperature map that I showed earlier, also from the National Climate Assessment. Um, in this case, uh, the gradations are percentage. The darkest green are 15% increase in average annual precipitation over the last 20 years. Um, the darkest browns are a decrease in 15%. And again, important regional differences in the difference of trend. Now, for New England, I think this ends up being one of the most important pieces of the puzzle. And this, this is definitely important from a watershed management perspective. And that is not only are we getting an increase in average annual precipitation, but the way we're getting our precipitation is changing. And this has everything to do with the atmosphere heating up, the warmer atmosphere can hold more water vapor. And when we get precipitation, it's coming down increasingly as heavy precipitation events. And that means also a diminishment in, in moderate and mild precipitation events. Um, this very much lines up with what we saw this winter, these incredibly heavy snowfalls. It also lines up with what we're seeing in the warmer months in the way of, of very heavy downpours. So, I mean, this, this certainly drives us in the direction of having to think more about the impact of flash flooding, the impact of impervious surface and watersheds, and I think argues strongly for a green infrastructure approach, which I'll we'll speak to in a moment. Uh, this is national trends in flood magnitude. Um, as you can guess, this trends along with the changes in annual precipitation 
and the changes in um, heavy precipitation. Now this is sort of all the analysis that includes watershed characteristics, so antecedent conditions in the watershed, soil moisture, etc., are in the mix here. Um, now, again, uh, thinking about urban environments is really a special case when you get a high percentage of impervious surface, there's a much stronger direct link between the heavy precipitation and the runoff. So, um, you know, for our urban areas, um, we're seeing a much more pronounced problem that doesn't really show up on this map. Again, this is projections out to the end of the century. Um, this has been a very difficult area for the modelers to get a handle on. It's only been within the last 10 to 15 years that the models have really started to come into alignment in terms of the sign of the change that's likely to be seen globally and, and change in precipitation. Um, so most of the models now fit with the pattern that you see here, and that is an increase over time up into Canada and you know, the northern tier of the U.S., um, decreasing precipitation over time from the southwest and down into Mexico. Um, nobody knows for sure where this dividing line is going to set up between the two and exactly what the conditions will be there. Now again, from a watershed management perspective, take a look at the summer map down in the lower left because we're in a situation here in the northeast where the forecast is for increasing precipitation but essentially a steady state situation during the summer months. And you combine that steady state situation with warming temperatures, so you've got higher evaporation rates, and higher evapotranspiration, and longer growing season, and increasing population, and therefore an increase in impervious surface. All of that drives us to a situation where even if we've gotten more annual rainfall, we may in fact see more problems with water deficit during the summer months. The demand is going to go up, groundwater recharge is going to be challenged, and a lot of our surface water resources will be challenged by the higher evaporation rates. Okay, moving on to sea level rise. Um, this is measurement of, of two of the largest um, ground ice sheets um, globally, the, the Greenland ice sheet in the North and the Arctic and South. And in both cases, we're seeing a decrease in ice mass over time. And as you might guess, with that trend going on, this is what's happening globally. The sea level trends are moving from 0.8 millimeters per year um, on the left, 1.9 in the center portion of the graph, and then tipping up to 3.2 millimeters per year. Um, now, uh, you know, a couple of, of factors that really make it difficult to forecast sea level rise rates going forward. The first is clearly we don't have a handle on exactly what greenhouse gas emissions rates are going to be. The other is that the understanding of ice melt dynamics is progressing very rapidly, and there's been surprise after surprise in the scientific community about the speed with which we're starting to see warm ocean water undercut the edges of, of land-based ice. So um, my anticipation is that in, in, in this slide arrays a number of different modeling approaches to trying to forecast sea level rise out to the end of the century. Uh, this is in meters. Um, it shows you both the low end for a particular modeling suite and the high end. So we've got you know, a number of the low ends coming in at about you know, half a meter by the end of the century. At the high end here, we've got um, the most extreme case showing two meters. Um, now, my thought is that with the trends we've got in emissions and the continual surprises that we're getting on, on melt rates, it's probably going to be a situation where the higher end of this is what ends up playing out. Um, another thing to be aware of, and I'm sure you've seen this in the news, is that we've now passed tipping points with several of the ice sheets where it's, it's likely that regardless of what we do with emissions in the future, um, these sheets are going to continue to disintegrate. Now this is something that's going to take place over a period of centuries, so it's not that it's going to radically change our situation you know, over the next 50 to 100 years, but it does set us up for a situation where we've got to now plan for continued long-term sea level rise in the coastal zone. You know, we've passed that point. Um, and the other thing, you know, if you look at paleoclimate, in the past, sea level rise has not been linear. Um, there will be periods, you know, as this, this ice sheet disintegration happens, where the, the rates are going to change, and, and sometimes quite sharply. Now, we don't know when that's going to occur. Um, it will probably not be in our lifetimes. It doesn't appear to be in the cards. But again, thinking in terms of, of you know, what we do in the way of coastal zone development, we've got to keep that in mind. So we're going to go through periods you know, in the next 500 years when rise rates will likely spike. All right. 
Any questions on the climate side? Yeah. Scale broad brush approaches. Um, you know, EPA and some other organizations um, draw this definition down to mean sort of site specific stormwater management features like rain gardens, etc. Um, but I'm, I'm going to read you this definition. Um, and I think this is a, a good way to frame it. This is, this is from some work by Mark Bennett, who's going to take some of his colleagues. Um, a network of waterways, wetlands, woodlands, wildlife habitats, and other natural areas that support native species maintain natural ecological processes, sustain air and water resources, and contribute to health and quality of life. So this is really a big picture definition of green infrastructure, and you can really think about it applying on a, on a full watershed scale. All right, you can tell me where this is. Yep, yep, okay, yeah, well, so, southern tip of Cape Cod, and I love this image, uh, you know, it, it was, it's a satellite image, it's taken on the and the water clarity is good, so you can see right through to the bottom, and it, it really gives you a, a, a great idea of, of the, the type of sediment transport dynamics that you've got in a healthy, resilient, flexible section of the coast, you know, where it's not really been impeded by development. And this is a system that can move and change, you know, as storms come and go. Um, you know, it really gives you just a, a, a great um, illustration of, of how sediment moves around in a system like this. All right, where are we now? <laughs> yeah, we're in situ. <laughs> and they've got a little bit of a different situation there. Now, now um, it's been pointed out to me that this is not necessarily a fair comparison. This is obviously north of the Cape, a, a very different system. But nonetheless, I mean, this is indicative of what happens when you draw a line in the sand you have a harder shoreline, things can't move anymore, and it's just very, very typical that the beach erodes away in front of that, and then you're left with a situation that is just really, really difficult. Um, you, know, you put that against the backdrop of rising sea levels, and you've got a challenge on your hands. All right, so what am I talking about in the way of green infrastructure features if we're thinking about um, watershed resiliency to climate change? Um, intact dune systems, unimpeded sediment transport, healthy tidal and non-tidal wetlands, and forested uplands. So, you know, just exactly what you would see in an undeveloped stretch of southeastern Massachusetts. And we're fortunate because we still have a large number of areas where, where these systems are intact. Uh, also included in the definition here are reconstructed features. And this could be constructed wetlands and dunes, um, sediment replenishment associated with beach nourishment projects, um, reforestation of riparian corridors and reforestation of the uplands. Also included here are hybrid features, um, living shorelines, which we'll talk about a little bit, and constructed reefs and breakwaters. All right, to the, the question of living shorelines, this is um, an illustration from Virginia Institute of Marine Science, and this is an approach that works well in, in low energy environments, a, a great alternative to hardened shorelines. This includes a living breakwater, um, submerged aquatic vegetation in the low energy area um, on the near shore side of that, uh, a tidal marsh transitional zone, and then the upland into a forest. And this is a great situation because it provides a number of different ecosystem services. Um, you address multiple ecological stressors, the need to keep habitat intact, the need for good water exchange. Um, you attenuate wave energy with this sort of approach. Um, you can actually reduce infrastructure costs, particularly in a situation like we're in here in southeastern Massachusetts, where we've still got a lot of intact resource. So what we're talking about is protecting what we've already got on the landscape, and to some extent working to try to knit that back together. And that's really, you know, if you think in terms of the fiscal challenges of trying to adapt to climate change, I mean, this is money in the bank, and this is something that we've really got to get good at talking about and making sure the leaders in our community are very clear that this is a way that they can save money over the long haul as opposed to great infrastructure solutions. Now, there are certainly some limitations associated with the infrastructure approach. It's not going to provide the same level of flood protection that you would get out of a, a dike or a levee system. 
Um, it's difficult or expensive to retrofit areas that are highly urban. Um, I'm sure those of you who are working on those types of projects understand that. Um, and if we do get out on the higher end of that emission spectrum and we're dealing with very rapid change, it could be that, that we're quite close to the case uh, with that. All right, so a few example projects. All right, where are we now? Venice, yeah, we're in Venice. Hopefully this is not the week that you booked your vacation. <laughs> Venice has got a couple of problems. They've got a problem with subsidence, which we actually have here on the East Coast, in particular cities like Boston that were built on fill are subsided fairly rapidly. We've also got natural background subsidence as well. Um, and then obviously, um, just like every other coastal location in the world, Venice is subject to sea level rise. Um, here's an aerial shot. Um, Gives you an idea of the configuration of the lagoon that Venice sits in, um, three inlets, and so you've got a situation there where there are some opportunities for a green gray infrastructure approach to sort of deal with the problem that you've got there. And, and in fact, this is, uh, to my way of thinking, one of the most fascinating examples out there right now of a hybrid approach. So, kind of step one in this process is the green infrastructure piece, and this involves the reconstruction of the salt marsh and the lagoon system. So, I'll just fairly quickly walk you through here. These are self-explanatory. I think it is important to note that they've got an interesting linkage here between navigational dredging and, and this restoration project. Uh, moving on, they've, they've built up the islands. This is a replanning process. And voila, we have the salt marsh once again. And being a management presentation, this is the obligatory bird picture section. Uh, this, is, <laughs> this is a red shank on the reconstructed marsh. Here's an habitat, so you can see it is actually being used as habitat. All right, now for the gray infrastructure part. Now one of the real problems that we've seen um, in the, you know, the, the Dutch approach, at least initially, on flood control, oftentimes was, was, was closing off estuaries, which is, you know, if you want to kill an estuary, that's the, the quickest way to do it. So the fascinating thing about the approach here in Venice is that their floodgate system, you know, 99% of the time, when it is not deployed, it's down in the seafloor. And so it's, it's not at all affecting the um, water exchange in and out of the lagoon. And the way this system works is when they need to deploy it, they pump each of these cells full, full of air, pump the water out, pump the air in. And they actually pop up from that hinge in the back. So here's a test. This is for the units. Deployed, they, it gives them about 10 feet of freeboard, and when the system is, is fully up and operational, they'll be able to fully close each of those three inlets that I showed you in the map. So this is a situation where they get their flood protection, um, they've managed to revitalize the ecosystem in the lagoon, and they've set up a situation where 99% of the time, this system is not going to interfere with the healthy functioning of that estuary. So I think it's just, now, tremendously expensive project, this is probably not the kind of thing that's going to be feasible everywhere, but for the major urban areas on the East Coast, I think this is a great example. All right, um, coming out of, of Hurricane Sandy, um, there's been a tremendous amount of work. Um, there was a design competition called Rebuild by Design that was held. Um, recently, they announced a, a set of winning projects that will at least get seed funding to, to go into the first st stage of construction. Uh, this is one of those projects that got the funding. It's called Living Breakwaters. Um, this shows you um, the area that we're talking about. Um, it's the south end of, of Staten Island. And I apologize if this was a little tough to read. I'll kind of walk you through what you're seeing here. The large map, they show the positioning of, of the new breakwater structures. Um, the smaller inset map, what you're seeing is that they're going to create a low wave energy um, area inshore of the breakwaters. And then that, in turn, is going to set them up so that they can use a living shoreline solution. And they, they've attenuated the wave energy, and, and so they've, they've created that opportunity for the living shorelines. Uh, now, this is a diagram of, of what they've got in mind for the breakwaters themselves. Um, a lot of attention being paid to different depths of water to provide different habitat opportunities. And also, they're paying a lot of attention to features like surface roughness that allow um, biogenic accumulation on, on the surface of the reef. So this is very much designed to be a hybrid between a gray infrastructure approach and a green infrastructure approach, um, and, and certainly something that um, appears to be one of the better options 
in a situation where attenuated wave energy and, and associated damages is one of your key objectives. Um, one other uh, piece that you should be aware of coming out of, of all the work that's been done in conjunction with Sandy, and that is that the Corps of Engineers has really gotten religion on, on green infrastructure. Uh, I think it's been forced on them, but they, they're, they're going down that road now. And, and they, they refer to this as nature-based infrastructure. They, they felt that green infrastructure had been used in so many different ways that it was a bit ambiguous. And that unfortunately is the case. But uh, you know, I'm not going to walk you through this, but just be aware that what is going on is that the poor is finally going to bite the bullet on setting up a framework to include green infrastructure or nature-based infrastructure in their cost-benefit analysis. Um, now, there are huge difficulties associated with trying to assign economic value to ecosystem services. I'm sure you guys are aware of that. Um, but this is going to create a framework that in turn, I think, can be used um, at the regional level and at the local level. Um, and, and I think its utility will extend beyond Corps of Engineers projects. So um, if you're interested in this topic, I can point you towards some of the publications. This is still an ongoing process, but I think it, it really bodes well we're putting green infrastructure sort of on equal footing with gray infrastructure um, for some of these um, watershed projects. All right, and finally, um, a, a couple of, of local examples. Um, this is the Beaver Dam Brook watershed, and one of the first projects I worked on at Manor was a series of climate change adaptation plans. Um, so, um, Beaver Dam Brook, this is an aerial photograph, and historically, um, the, the heart of this watershed has been in cranberry production. Um, it's now transitioning out of that. There's a very ambitious environmental restoration project underway. Um, one of the things that we did in our look at this watershed was a, a simple bathtub model of sea level rise. Um, what you see here in the darker red is areas um, two meters or less above sea level, um, in the intermediate shade up to three, and then in the lightest pink up to four. And so um, sort of discovery in this is that this is a relatively flat watershed. There's not much topographic gain going in them. And so when we get up to about between two and three meters of sea level rise, this system is going to start to flip from being a freshwater system to being a tidal saltwater system. And I think this is indicative of a lot of the change that we're going to see in southeastern Massachusetts. Now, we don't know exactly what the time frame is, but it's certainly something to be cognizant of and to think about in any environmental restoration work that you're involved in. Um, the Taunton River watershed, on um, much larger scale, we did a similar look there. Now in the Taunton, you've got impacts of sea level rise, um, very vulnerable fresh water flooding, uh, a rising water table, um, you've got water balance issues, and environmental justice concerns. So this is kind of an all-in approach to a, a challenge with, with climate change adaptation. Um, same sort of bathtub model look at sea level rise impacts. Now here, as you go um, slightly inland from the, the river's edge, you don't see much impact because of topographic gain. Um, but this is a fairly flat watershed as you go upstream, and so the impacts do, in fact, carry um, into the interior of the watershed. Now we put together a couple of thematic maps to try to get people to think through um, you know, what the resource base is, and with the Taunton, as is the case with southeastern Massachusetts, you do still have an intact resource base to draw on. And if we're smart enough to capitalize on that, it can really um, help us out in our quest for making this resilient watershed. Um, shown in the sort of tan color are areas where you've got a water balance deficit. These are the headwater areas. This has everything to do with public water supply. Um, and lack of sufficient groundwater recharge. So we flag those as areas, as I said before, with climate change, we're going to have some challenges in this arena. So it's very important that in future development decisions, we maintain opportunities for groundwater infiltration, and at some point, we're going to have to look at um, trying to manage demand. Um, and the sort of bluish colors, um, we've got areas formed with freshwater flooding. Um, in red, we've got the same sea level rise information I showed you on the, the maps previously. And then also included with this are the proposed light rail stops for the South Coast Rail Project. I know this is, is controversial because of some of its impacts, but with climate change, we're in a situation where we've really got to make some of these hard trade-off decisions between um, drawing down our, our greenhouse gas footprint and at the same time trying to maximize resiliency of these natural systems. So we put that on there as a way to get people to 
think about, you know, okay, in future development decisions, um, is it possible to do more in the way of clustering development, and therefore having a bit less impact in other portions of the watershed? Now, the second thematic map that we put together is much more about habitat. Um, two sets of information here. One is the sort of on the ground resource, if you will. We lean heavily on the Biomap 2 work for that. So we've got major impact wetlands complexes in this watershed, major forested areas, and then show up in green. Um, you've also got areas shown in yellow of high geophysical diversity. Um, this is a relatively new way of thinking about planning for climate and biodiversity going forward. The idea being those areas of high geophysical diversity will inherently support high biodiversity as the climate warms. So we've, we've highlighted that. In fact, we found a few areas that really weren't on the radar screen in this watershed in terms of protection. So I think that's an important factor to think about. All right. Um, we're currently working. We've got uh, an interdisciplinary group that includes federal, state, regional planning agencies, um, nonprofits, universities, etc. Um, we're working now to put together a green infrastructure template for the watershed, um, do some cost-benefit analysis on green infrastructure, and then to roll that all into a regional training program. And our hope is that we can get this up and running in the town, and then that's something that will be available to adjacent watersheds. All right, so in closing, um, a, a quick summary of, of my thinking on climate change impacts in terms of watershed management. Um, certainly enhanced flood threat. Um, I think it's, it's obvious with storm surge, I mean, that, that's going to be in our lifetimes um, how sea level rise really changes the coast. I mean, those are going to be the events that make a difference. Um, freshwater flooding, particularly in those watersheds with a high percentage of impervious surface, as I spoke to earlier. Um, rising water tables um, in those areas um, that are dominantly on septic, um, close to the water's edge. Um, I mean, this is already known as a problem. It's, it's, it's going to be an enhanced problem going forward. We really need to think about how we're going to deal with that in any future planning efforts. Um, increased fluctuation and in drinking water supply, as I said, a bit counterintuitive. More rainfall overall likely, but perhaps punctuated in summertime with more problems with adequate supply. Um, increased stress on ecosystems and increased stress on grant infrastructure. So, I think there really are a, a set of challenges and opportunities uh, before us here. And, and I really would like to underscore the opportunities because I think this is a situation where the people in this room can really make a difference in helping our leaders understand the value of the ecosystem services provided by the intact resource that we've still got in southeastern Massachusetts. So we need to make the case that regional cooperation is in fact in light and self-interest. I mean, you know, climate change doesn't know anything about locality boundaries. We need to think in terms of whole functional ecological systems and, and we really need to be um, sort of clear in, in our communication of that. Uh, we need to do a better job of demonstrating the cost savings associated with protecting the intact natural resources that we've got in southeastern Massachusetts. This, I mean, this, this is the only example of a free lunch in climate change adaptation that I can think of. Uh, it provides multiple benefits and we've just got to get really good at describing both the fiscal benefits, the ecological benefits, and the health and safety benefits for the citizens of the region. Um, I would really like to see more work done in the way of establishing green infrastructure templates for the watersheds in southeastern Massachusetts. We've got a, a tremendously rich base of GIS information to draw on, but I think that an additional step is needed to clearly articulate the highest value resources so that when localities update comprehensive plans, zoning codes, et cetera, they've got an opportunity to key into a template that works for the whole watershed. I think right now we have not done a good enough job in, in articulating what that template looks like. Um, certainly we need regulatory reform, but it's got to be tied to market-based solutions. There's just no way in the world we're going to solve this problem purely from a regulatory basis. Um, certainly credit trading and transfer of development rights programs are problematic. We see a lot of failures, but there are also some good examples out there, particularly in the TDR arena. And I would submit to you that, that that's probably one of the best hopes that we've got to maintain the entire natural resource base that's still in the landscape here in this part of the world. Um, certainly we've got to support efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And as I said before, this may entail some difficult trade-off decisions at some points, but I think we've got to do it. And finally, um, we all need to advocate 
for the inclusion of green infrastructure and regional planning initiatives, um, local comprehensive plan updates, local zoning code updates, and when design standards are renewed. So thank you. And we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I <clears throat> question maybe to talk to you a little bit. Um, given the projections for climate change and sea level rise, if there are uh, species or systems that exist that may be a lost cause in terms of, of saving or uh, conducting restoration projects, you know, for example, comes to mind as salt marshes. Put a lot of time and effort into salt marsh restoration protection, but they may just not be able to pace with those projections. I'm sorry. I, my, I guess I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that. And, and yeah, well, I mean, it, I mean, as, as you know, I mean, one of the best things we can do is maintain opportunities for upslope migration to wetlands as the sea level comes up. I'm, I'm sure you're totally, you know, keyed into that. It, it, it does set up a really difficult question if you're in a situation where a previously vital salt marsh is starting to disintegrate, and given living limited resources, you know, on the part of all the, the groups represented here, you know, I, I think that it, you, you may be better off spending your, your limited money, your limited staff time, thinking about what, what can be done to maintain those opportunities for upslope migration, rather than spending your resources fighting a losing battle to try to patch back together a system that's coming apart. I mean, again, tough decision. But, you know, yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you have any
And, you know, I mean, we've got, you know, some little sub areas where we've got that kind of information. What we're lacking is, is more of a comprehensive framework. Now, that, that problem is not specific to southeastern Massachusetts or New England. I mean, it's, it's you know, everywhere I've, I've worked. But, you know. but how do we get there? I, I think among these groups that we've got here in conjunction with the government agencies, if a proposal could be written that is not fiscally onerous, um, it, you know, we'd have some opportunity with it. I mean, you know, it, it, that, that's not a panacea. I mean, there's certainly many things you'd like to get at that are much more expensive to monitor, and I'm not arguing that those things are unimportant. But, you know, I think um, if, if you're not in a situation where it's a program that can be funded year over year, you know, you're, you're, you're not going to get it. And that, that's what typically kills most monitoring programs. Are we going to take one more question? I just, uh, I just wanted to add that there is an effort going on in the um, northeast from the New York Valley up to um, Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, well, thank you much.